Thank you very much, Jorge, for that brilliant presentation. I, I told you he would be very brilliant. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, it was also, in a funny kind of way, even uplifting, uh, despite what's happening around the continent. So let's go straight into our first uh, panel discussion. Uh, we'll be talking about Vietnam, um, Estonia, and Latin America. And we have a, a very um, uh, distinguished um, panel today. Um, let me introduce first uh, Bill Ratliff. Um, an old friend of mine, uh, and also a, a, a very distinguished uh, scholar. Um, he's a research fellow uh, at the Independent Institute and a member of the Board of Advisors of the Institute's uh, Center on Global Prosperity. Uh, he received his PhD uh, in Latin American and Chinese history from the uh, University of Washington. Uh, he's also a research fellow and a curator of the Americas Collection at the Hoover Institution um, at Stanford University, of which he is extremely proud, and rightly so. Um, he's the author of several books, and his articles have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, the Washington Post, and Los Angeles Times, among other major newspapers. He has taught at Stanford University, uh, San Francisco State University, the University of San Francisco, a Tunga University in Taiwan, um, a diplomatic academy at Lake Tahoe, and other universities. Um, he's the author of Vietnam Rising, as uh, David Thoreau mentioned at the beginning of this uh, program, and we will have copies available for you at the end of this event. Um, then we will hear um, from Frederick Erickson, uh, who will be speaking about uh, the case of uh, Estonia. Um, Frederick just uh, arrived from uh, Sweden, and we're very happy to have him here with us. Um, he's a, a director of the uh, European Center for uh, International Political Economy, which he co-founded in 2006. Um, he's a, an economist who was educated at uh, Uppsala University, Oxford University, and the London School of Economics. He was the chief economist at Timbro, the leading Swedish think tank, uh, where he uh, supervised Timbro's economics research programs and specialized in international and development economics. Uh, he's been a consultant to international organizations, companies, uh, governments, and uh, ministries. He's the author of uh, several books and papers on international economics. And then finally, we'll hear from uh, Gabriel Casave, uh, who's uh, with us at the Independent uh, Institute. Uh, he'll be speaking about uh, Latin America. Um, he's a, a research analyst uh, with us at the Center on Global Prosperity at the Independent Institute, and a research fellow with the Fundacion Atlas, uh, 1853 in uh, Buenos Aires, in his home country of Argentina. Uh, he studied political science at the uh, Lock Haven State College in Pennsylvania. He received his master's degree in economics and business administration from ESEADE, uh, a very prestigious uh, school in Buenos Aires, and his law degree from the University of Buenos Aires. He has taught economics and law at the University of Buenos Aires and San Jose State University in California. Um, he was part of the research team that worked on the case study on the barter clubs in, in Argentina. Uh, that is one of the uh, chapters in uh, Lessons from the Poor. Uh, he's also a very close friend of mine, and he was uh, very, very helpful, together with uh, Wayne Pugh, who is here with us in putting together this uh, great program. Thank you, Wayne, and thank you, Gabriel. So let's hear from Bill first. OK, I'd like to also to add, uh, thank very quickly um, the Atlas Foundation and the Independent Institute. Uh, and all who are uh, affiliated therewith, uh, particularly Alvaro Vargas Llosa, because he recognized uh, when I came back from Vietnam a couple of years ago and was doing some short-scale op-ed type writing on it that maybe I'd like to do something longer, and so he's the one who got me to do this book, which is uh, either in your packets or I think will be available to you, The Vietnam Rising. Um, it's very difficult to father, follow President Quiroga. I, I spent a lot of time working on Latin America, and he just makes me want to jump in the air and, and talk about Latin America. But today, I'm sort of the outsider in the group talking about Asia. I think I'm the only one who's focusing specifically on Asia, although we do have one Europe as well. But uh, uh, the rest of it is, is Africa and Latin America. Um, however, I think what I did with Vietnam, I believe, dovetails exactly into what Alvaro and his fellow contributors in, in the, uh, the poor book are, are talking about. And I'll be um, trying to, to uh, I, will, I will keep to uh, 15 minutes, hit me. Yeah. And, um, and I'll try to keep it short as, uh, shorter than that, or at least as short. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Vietnam today, a little bit about the Asian context. 
uh, a little bit about Chinese tradition and the importance I think that has in what's been happening in these places, and then a few comments on specific programs and so forth in Vietnam. There's a lot more on that in the book that's, uh, that's available to you. The, um, the uh, Economist had a special uh, report on Vietnam about several months ago, uh, earlier this year, and they concluded that Vietnam was the darling of foreign investors, and indeed it has been in many ways in recent years. Um, it's uh, it's uh, gotten uh, uh, something like, I think, a thousand in the last 10 months, something like a thousand uh, uh, pledged uh, investments into into the country uh, worth something like 60 billion dollars, almost 60 billion dollars. The reason that it's that it's so popular in this way is that is that it's had a 7.5 annual GDP growth rate since about 1991, which is quite impressive. Um, uh, it's been you know there've been ups and downs, but basically if you average it out, it's that. And the level of poverty within the country, uh, such as those can be measured, has fallen from 75 percent. Um, in 1986, when the reforms began, to about 20 percent, 15 to 20 percent today, which is a pretty, pretty uh, uh, good uh, decline in poverty. But Vietnam today, I would argue, is at a real crossroad, and it's going to have to make some changes because it's been able to do things well enough that they have made this kind of progress uh, in many respects, which I'll touch on. But it is also in danger of becoming simply a grunt economy and staying essentially where it is, where you have un un unskilled labor producing men manufactured goods which are shipped abroad and also shipping abroad the fruits of the earth ranging from coffee and sugar to oil. And I think that is not what the leaders and it's not what the people in the country want, but they're at a point now where they're going to have to make some changes if they want to go ahead. And I'll, I'll mention what some of those are. There's a kind of a tug of war today, I think, in, in Vietnam. And the tug of war is between those, those groups and, and individuals who want to promote change, further change, and certain kinds of change, or they want to impede it. And um, the, the, is the problem economics? This is the first thing that comes up. We're talking about reforms, talking about economic development. Is the problem economics? Well, of course, in some ways it is. You've got to so-called get the economics right or get it basically right or get something, something that is in a semblance of the right kind of economics in order for you to have the, the economic development. But there's a whole lot more than that. I wish it were only economics. Um, the problem is that traditional culture and institutions also have a very great impact. And these are culture and institutions that date back into more than five decades of communism and, f and two millennia, more than two millennia of Chinese tradition there. Culture and the economic and the institutions in a way, uh, or the culture in particular, is something like love and vengeance and God. They are impossible to quantify, but they can be more powerful in the decisions that are made by the leaders of country, by you or me, or by the leaders of this country, than all of the rational discussion and all of the common sense and all of the data you can collect. And the thing is that in, in Vietnam, some of the main leaders in the country, many of the main leaders in the country have other things than economics in mind. Economics too, but other things as well. And those other things often override the decisions that would improve the economy. Now, I'm a, very quickly, and this is going to be very quickly, I'm going to touch on the region, because Vietnam is in a region which, as you know very well, has been growing very fast in recent decades. And you have the call the tigers or the, or the dragons or whatever you want to call them in Asia, those so-called, in varying degrees, miracle economies, development economies that have come up since the Second World War in particular. They have a variety of characteristics, common ones. They're sort of the, that they do, in fact, want economic development and, we're, and are willing and able to focus on that subject for a significant period of time, not going back and forth and up and down, as happens in some parts of the world. Um, they have uh, an, an orientation toward markets with all sorts of characteristics, uh, according to individual countries. And they have all of the ones that are the major growth areas in Asia have a long relationship to China in one way or another. Four of the countries are Chinese, essentially, or largely Chinese. Three of them have very, very long histories of Confucianism in their countries, and Vietnam is one of those three. And the rest of them have minorities in the countries, which are by far the most economically prosperous group within those individual countries. And so there, this can't be simply an accident. It's not the total answer to anything, but it can't be an accident that there is this kind of a relationship 
relationship there. Now, Vietnam is getting off to a slow start. The uh, slow start means that the Vietnamese today, I was there and in Indonesia just about two weeks ago and, and saw these first two countries right then. The Vietnamese are about, about two-thirds as far along in the, in the purchasing power parity to the degree that this, that this is helpful uh, that as far as the, as the Indonesians are. They have only about a third of the purchasing power parity that the average Thai has today. So Vietnam has a long ways to go. Now, what are the roots of the Confucianism and the importance of that in Vietnam? Um, Vietnam was part of China for a thousand years, and that ended in 938 AD. After 938 AD, according to a, a, one of the deans in the uh, law school in Hanoi, after the occupiers had gone, that is the Chinese, uh, Confucianism remained and expanded to generate the standard norms that would govern the society for centuries. And that, uh, what, what, what are those? And I'm going to focus on two, basically. One is what uh, John Fairbank at Harvard had called the imperial Confucianism. Imperial Confucianism, and this relates directly to Vietnam, so I'm not just talking China here, to an authoritarian, a kind of authoritarian paternalism. And this is, a, a one thing, a commitment to groups in preference to individuals. Therefore, it follows a, a disdain uh, to, for private enterprise and for individual entrepreneurship and, in, and initiative, and setting up an apparatus to enforce what it wants and what it is dictating. Uh, now, this apparatus and this, this long-term acceptance of authoritarian paternalism in Vietnam, as in China, is one of the things that legitimizes the Communist Party in Vietnam. It's not because they do a good job. Now, they won the revolution back, back against the French in the United States and, and everything that preceded that. But they, in fact, their early economic development was dreadful. And it was only in 1986 that they began to change. But there was no question about whether they were in charge before 86 or after 86. And much of this relates to the legitimacy of the Confucian tradition. Today, you see it in the, uh, this, this tradition in the monopolization of power by the Communist Party. You see it in, in, in one thing that I focus on a lot in my book and will comment more here today than other things, and that's state-operated, state-owned enterprises, the SOEs. And the SOEs, uh, which the, basically the leaders of the Vietnam Communist Party still think are going to be the foundation of a future socialism in Vietnam, um, are have half of the country's assets in, in, under their control, but they create almost no new jobs and they create very little of the new, of the real growth in the country. Now you have another side of Confucianism, so that in, in, in the Chinese tradition you have a, a pro-development side and an anti-development side, and usually the anti-development is the paternalism, and the pro is the other thing that Alvaro and all of you folks are writing about um, in, in, uh, in the poor book. Uh, you don't mind if I call it the poor no, book? No, no. I could call it the lessons book. Maybe I should call it like call it that. And this is what I would call people's Confucianism. And this is what has, has, has seeped down into the population as a whole, whether they're Chinese or not. Vietnamese in Vietnam, they're mostly Vietnamese. But it's something that has seeped down over, over many, many, many centuries. And this is the thing that has helped to sustain them when they've had to live frequently with authoritarian paternalisms that didn't have their interests at all in mind. And among the deeply ingrained things from this, is a belief that education is the way to, to success. This all derives back to the Chinese tradition as well. Uh, a very rigorous work ethic, a, a sense of diligence, a frugality in the use of funds, very high savings rate, and a lot of the things that President Kuroga was noting that, in fact, are not the kind of things typically, unfortunately, that we, that we find in many parts of Latin America. Um, now, in, in the private sector, what you see as a result of this are, are millions of small household enterprises and small and medium enterprises, the SMEs. So these have grown up in Vietnam over the period since 1986. Now, be, to be sure, the Vietnamese Communist Party did permit these places to open. Before 1986, there couldn't be any of these things. You had only these state operations. In 86 and subsequently, particularly in 90 and, and in the last couple of, de, of, of years, they have really passed legislation that has made it possible for these things to happen. You don't get millions of these things developing if it's against the, the, uh, the Vietnamese Communist Party's allowing it. These groups 
taken with foreign direct in, in, uh, investment. The FDI and these little groups, 45% each of the growth, uh, the real growth rate in the country in recent years has come from them. So the SMEs are, if you look at what's happening domestically in terms of Vietnamese themselves, the SMEs are almost the only producers in the whole country that amount to anything. The uh, SOEs do not produce jobs or real growth in the country. The SMEs do. And they produce most of the new jobs within the country. The SOEs produce almost no new jobs in the country. So all of the life and vitality and the real growth in the country is either in foreign direct investment, which, of which there was a great deal, which has its ups and its downs, but it's also is primarily within these, these uh, groups of individuals and, and, and people who are operating as private entrepreneurs and who have set up these little, the little industries that uh, work relatively so well. Now, the problem that they have, there has been a glass ceiling built by the Communist Party in Vietnam. And this glass ceiling is, is kept there by the governments giving all of the preferences in land and in credit and in legal protection, or most of it in legal protection, almost all of it in the land and in the, in the credit to the SOEs. So it's extremely difficult for the SMEs, never mind the household enterprises, which aren't even, aren't even legally registered in the same way as the SMEs. Uh, there are a lot more household enterprises than there are the SMEs. But all of these have all of these burdens, having to fight to get land, not being able to get enough land really to expand. They simply can't get the land to expand. And they can't get the land in a long enough term to be able to, be able to invest and to get good full-time employees because the employees are likely to think that a year from now this guy's going to be gone because he's not going to be able to get a renewal of this land uh, or he's not going to be able to get credit. So great impediments to their success and yet nonetheless they are the success of Vietnam. Now the question today is, is the government going to shift that around? Are they going to really see that the vitality, the economic vitality of this, of this country is in these SMEs and in the household enterprises as well, which are more numerous but, but uh, generally smaller. Are they going to re remove these barriers so that these can, can grow into large enterprises, small and medium enterprises? It's not S-M-E-L enterprises. It's S-M-E, small and medium. You can't get to be a large independent enterprise in Vietnam because of these barriers that are here. And so are these barriers going to be removed? Or is, uh, is um, uh, Vietnam going to uh, remain uh, what it has been for so long? And that was more what I would say call a grunt country, which simply produces the education system is not good in Vietnam. It is expanded, but it's not. The quality is very low. And so far, they have essentially uh, un, an untrained workforces that are producing basically very simple goods and sending those abroad. Are they going to open it up so that they can move to this next level, which is going to be to make it possible for the SMEs and the household enterprises to really thrive beyond this considerable level that they've gone now, but which has this glass ceiling uh, stopping it from going farther. Thank you.